Okay, then go live. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Architecture Weekly YouTube channel. And today we have another interview with Baruch Sadagurski, a long friend of mine and, you know, co-host of several podcasts that we did together. So Baruch, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and uh, it's great to be here and honor. And uh, yeah, very, very happy to uh, to be hosted on the, on the, on the podcast. Cool, cool. Yeah, I'm happy as well. So uh, can you please give us like a short introduction? Yeah, so my name is Baruch and i am been developer advocate since, uh, uh, what, 2011, uh, 12 years by now. Um, most of this tenure with a company called JFrog that you might heard about. And if you did, part of it is thanks to the developer advocacy that that we did there um and now i work as a principal developer advocate in gradle also advise to a lot of startups and companies about uh, developer relations and developer advocacy and generally enjoy this topic a lot cool thank you very much for this introduction uh folks for those who just joined and who is watching this live Please don't hesitate to ask your questions in the you know in the chat section. So if, if they're interested, we're, we will be able to incorporate them in the conversation. So hopefully Baruch will be able to answer them. But uh, we'll start with uh, with my questions, right? I, I got a couple of those prepared. So you, you said developer advocacy, and uh, to to me and maybe to other people, it sounds like you like represent developers in the court and compete with an attorney on something like that. But what does this developer advocacy actually mean? What you actually yeah. fight for? So, so frankly, the the, the idea of uh, uh, like the word advocate being confused with attorney or or lawyer that's um, a, a false how do you call it, a false translation because in a lot of languages advocate actually means lawyer. Uh, in English, that's not the case. Advocate is someone who advocates for a group a position and that basically means help those groups or positions and this is what developer advocacy actually is uh, it's uh, being there for the developers advocating for them in the organization and also advocating for the organization with the developers and basically being this ambassador on both sides Okay, so you're trying to help developers, like all developers out there, or you're targeting a specific group? So that generally depends on your interests, on your passion, and uh, who pays you money. Uh, and uh, it, it also changes from, like the focus might, might change. So since my background with JFrog, uh, we obviously started as uh, whatever Maven Gradle repository, and it was mo mostly JVM developers that were kind of the uh, the community that I grew up and uh, advocated uh, in the early days. Uh, later, JFrog switched uh, to more of a cloud native co community and then security community, and obviously the focus changed. Now with Gradle, I kind of am back home uh, on the home turf with the JVM community, and that feels great. That really feels like I'm in home. Okay, so when you're talking about like uh, helping developers and making making their life easier, like what what does actually that mean? Like it's understanding API better or being more efficient with the product or like pushing the, the features to the product, like what, what's included? So um, as a developer advocate working for a specific company, uh, I am, you are, whatever developer advocate is in a unique position because they have access to that company. So when it comes to really thinking about how can I be useful to my community, it's mostly two things. It's first, I probably have better understanding of the product, so I can really help with uh, people with understanding what this product is, getting started with it, and then helping working with it better. But and the, the other advantage of being very close to the product itself is that I can provide the feedback from the community directly 
to the product team or the R&D team and make sure that th th they do the right thing for their community and for the developers. Okay, so th this starts starts to be interesting very much because, like in, in our company, we have a lot of you know product features on the, on on the plate, and uh, we fight very you know furiously about like what particular feature we will include in the product because that's a lot of things that are, like the, the value to the user, value to the company. I don't know the uh, the complexity of the feature to include. Like uh, to me, when when you're trying to say that like you're communicating the feedback from the developers to the product like, it shouldn't be just hey you missed that feature there should be some product work so what is your role in, in this you know conversation about what what feature you should pick up so i will ask you a very simple question where the product how the product comes up with their uh, with the list of features they want to implement with their backlog how well, they know which features are important for uh, their users? Well, they try to come up with some hypothesis. Like m maybe they're looking around in their competitors. Maybe they just, you know, relax on the sofa and they bang. They have uh, eureka moments and they like came up with, with something. And like that, there's a lot of people who come up with, with those ideas. And then they, they try to negotiate what features they will implement. And then actually for every feature, they, they try to estimate the impact, like how many millions of dollars that particular feature will bring you next year. So how about I will give you a better option than sitting on the sofa and dreaming about features. How about I can tell you what the users really want because I've asked them and they spoke to me because I'm their developer advocate. Of all those ways of coming up with features, the one that really works is doing what the users really need. And I'm the one who is going to tell you what are those features. Okay, okay. So, so we, there, we... Is, there is really no, there, there is no fight. There is no competition here. There is me bringing the real deal and everybody else speculating about what mo might or might not work. So in the end of the day, there is no there is no one who can provide as quality insights on the community as developer advocates okay so basically you're speaking to developers and asking them hey what's your biggest pain with the product right so wh where you spend the most time on and then then you're trying still still are you trying to prioritize because like developers can give you like five features at once and saying like hey i need this then i need this so this is this is a better uh, better conversation. This is a more I would say um, there, there there is something that really need to be discussed here. And and I would say yes, okay. So probably pro uh, product professionals have better skills in understanding what uh, uh prioritization bad both because they know better what resources are available in the company because they can assess uh, what will be the financial uh feature or the financial f f uh, impact of this feature so we can talk about prioritization but even there i can give a very important insight of how much pain the developer experience over this or that uh, deficiency in the product, right? So I can say yes. Uh, people talk. People tell me that this doesn't work, and they really miss this one. But the first one is really, really painful. I hear it from everybody, and it's like really bad. And the second is nice to have. So even there, I can provide real world feedback on what should be prioritized, but obviously here, uh, product people together with other functions in the company might have their own uh, prioritization decisions that will be made. Okay, so you, you still try to quantify those, uh, those decisions. So you're saying like users spend this amount of hours per week on this particular pain or like this amount of developers said this is crucial to them so it, it like the numbers are still there well there are numbers so uh, interesting story i don't know if you heard but probably some of your audience heard the saying plural of anecdote is not data yeah exactly 
right? Great. Now, there is a funny story about this quote. It's the other way around. The quote is, plural of anecdote is data. What? Google it. Now, it is the right quote because the author of the quote, and I keep uh, forgetting his name, he's uh, in social studies. And the data in social studies is a plural of anecdote. Think about it. All the numbers in social studies is the result of some social study. They asked people, they observed people, and people produced anecdotes that then they combined together and came up with data. The well, plural... Well, it's not precisely correct because some, some of the social studies is like making experiments. So it's not asking people, I just, you know, mo modulating the, the situations and seeing uh, the people's behavior. But okay, okay, like let, let's forget about it for the sake of argument. So plural of anecdote is data. And this is exactly the data that I bring. It's, it's a valid data, which is validated on social cohort of developers. Right. In the end of the day, we can argue whether my uh, group that I spoke with is representative or not. But that's my job to ask enough right people, to speak with enough right people, to hear from enough right people from different channels, via, via different channels, from different geographies, from different uh, usage types. So my anecdotes will be a valid data. And here, my job is to explain that, hey, it's not just my friend, you know, I hang out in conference with uh, Vladimir and he told me that he doesn't like how this works. So let's put everything aside and fix it for the guy, right? This is not how it works. The, the, the only way I can get credibility with my anecdotes is to make sure that they are perceived as data because I spoke with many developers on different channels. Um, not only those who come to conferences, but also uh, those who left questions in Stack Overflow and those who engage with me on social media and uh, others, and they all show this or that, or maybe not. Maybe I can say, okay, we are clearly see that people who come to a certain conference, QCon, which is targeted to a higher level of developers, team leaders and up, they see one pain, but people who don't attend conferences at all because they work in the company that doesn't um, encourage that. And I meet them elsewhere, let's say in your YouTube stream, they their pain is completely different. So let's talk about that. Yes, probably the team leaders have more bowing or decision power. So let's implement what they need first. So once we talk about not just, well, yeah, I heard that this feature is not good enough. Please go ahead and fi fix it on the next um, um, on the next version. If that's not the way how I approach it, but instead I bring anecdotes which look and feel like data because it is data, then obviously the discussion is much easier and I have a better credibility when it comes to, hey, Baruch said we need to do that. It means that we really need to go ahead and do that. Okay, now I got it. Thank you. So yeah, data as anecdotes is still data. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So let, let's talk a little bit about the terms. So like nowadays we we tend to confuse the you know the practices set of practices with the, with the titles and roles of people in the company. So like it happens with DevOps when people's just calling this term like SRE engineers. And like the, the same happens with the developer advocacy when like the, when I used to work for a previous company, they had DevRels, whatever they meant them to be. So what's actually wrong about all of those and like DevRels in particular? So it's 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 the same mistake. It's the same mistake of um assuming that all that there is one job in a certain area of expertise. Like how it's wrong with DevOps, exactly the same idea. DevOps is a set of methodologies and best practices, which is concentrated about on, on collaboration between Dev and Ops. There is a technical aspect to it. 
someone needs to set up the Kubernetes cluster that will ev that will enable the developers to own their uh, microservices oriented containerized software all the way from commit to production. When developers own their, uh, when there is an empowered team of engineers that own the product all the way from inception to production, we say, well, yes, DevOps happened. On the way, there are technical things that needs to be done. Someone needs to do that. And when company says, okay, what do we miss in our journey in order to do the the DevOps properly, well, all we miss is the cloud native setup. So we will, we will uh, hire people that will do that and they will be our DevOps people. I mean, I understand where it comes from, but it entirely misses the point uh, because the collaboration, which is the most important thing about DevOps, kind of got lost um, in the uh, technicalities of implementation of a platform that allows that. And this is obviously terrible because next thing you know, we miss the collaboration again, but now we miss collaboration between developers and the, those DevOps people. So let's come up with a new ideology that will be Dev DevOps. Dev DevOps is practices of how Dev and DevOps work together. Obviously, you're laughing because it doesn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah. And, 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 and people start to realize that. And, and thanks to that, we see now the rise of this term platform engineering. And platform engineering, well, before that, the correct term of people who implement the platform for DevOps was SRE, Site Reliability Engineers. This is a term that Google came up with to express exactly this mismatch to get away from DevOps engineers and start uh, using the right methodology for the people who enable that. But what I saw, um, the anecdotes, which are data, is that a lot of the people who conceive themselves DevOps engineers were offended by the replacement of the term with SRE. Because, hey, it's site reliability, but I do much more. Yes, we have a website and it's important for it to be up, but that's not this term, site reliability engineering, is not expressing what I really do. I heard it from a number of people. And I think this is one of the reasons why the term SRE didn't catch up. What did catch up is a broader term, platform engineering. Now, platform engineering, this is something that your ex DevOps engineer can get behind because this is expressed exactly what they are doing. They are building a platform on which DevOps might be uh, enabled if the processes, the collaboration, the culture in the company uh, is there, right? It's not having this platform um, is a requirement for having DevOps, but not, uh, but not enough. Uh, so people who now do all this work of setting up your Kubernetes cluster, the clusters and what's not, the platform engineering is much better term to describe them. And this is why it's catching. People are fine with being renamed from the wrong term uh, DevOps engineer to the right term uh, platform engineer, and this works well. Exactly the same thing we see with developer relations. Now, the, the, the short for developer relations is DevRel, which sounds almost like DevOps, uh, but it's, it's, it's something uh, kind of related because in the end of the day, it's a practice of approaching uh, organizational processes, right? So developer relations is the entire uh, aspect of how do we work with developers. Now, there are very, very different roles in developer relations. Think about it. You have your community managers, what it's called community managers. I have an issue with this term as well because you don't really manage community. Uh, community exists by itself. And you cannot come there and say, well, now I manage the JVM community. No, you don't. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but for the lack of better terms, those are the people who help the developer relations organization engage better with the community. 
It might be people who know everybody and know how to do the right intro to get the right audience. It might be people who build those bridges between different people in the community. It might be people who manage advocacy programs in the community, something like Java champions or Docker captains or CNCF ambassadors, this kind of stuff, programs. So those are by definition, not technical people. But you also have developer advocates, which by definition should be super technical because they are the ambassadors of the technology and the product in the community. They need to know exactly how this product works or how it doesn't work. And they need to understand this feedback that we spoke about very deeply and be able to speak about it and act about it, help the developers out there with very deep technical questions. So when you have those op almost opposite um, job descriptions under one umbrella saying, well, this person is a DevRel in a certain organization doesn't really make sense. DevRel what? Are they community managers? Are they developer advocates? Maybe they are engineers in DevRel. Those also exist. And those will be your software engineers that work on um, the uh, integrations, the APIs, uh, the, the tools that developers will really need to work better with the product, even if the, it's not a part of the core product. Dev so demo, demo projects, documentation. Right, demo project, exactly. So DevOps, Dev, DevRel engineers are also in DevRel. Are they the same job as your community managers? Probably not. So this term doesn't have any, doesn't, doesn't make any sense as well. So if I got it right, so uh, what what companies tend to do is replace the culture with you know with people with titles. So instead of thinking about how we can improve the the product for the developers, they're like, yeah, forget it. We we have a person who is like managing that. And, and that's this it. is understandable because uh, culture um, changes, and uh, um, uh, you know. Uh, more cognitive changes are much harder to do than, you know, just take a person, put the label on, on them and let them work. Uh, so it's, it's obviously, it's obviously understandable. It's usually won't bring the right results. I think in, in DevOps is much more profound and much more dangerous uh, in DevRel. Well, once you understand that by DevRel manager, most of the companies really mean this community manager and their sole role is to kind of enable developer relations as much as possible without having any resources to do that. Good luck to them. Uh, it's it's less traumatic than in, in, in DevOps, but still probably won't produce the right results for the company. Okay. Okay. Got it. So uh, which kind of companies should have developer relation practices and developer advocates in particular in the first place. So for example, should Bolt or Uber have them? Or So there are mostly uh, three types of three goals for developer relations. The first, uh, the original, I would say, the one that the entire developer relation discipline came up was, is product developer relations. And by product developer relations, I mean, there is a product that it's uh, developers are their audience. Uh, developers hate uh, traditional marketing. Developer relations is a great way to make sure that the product does what the, pro the, the, the developers need the product to do. And it's also a great way for us to make sure that the developers know about our product. And that will be your JFrog, your Gradle, uh, you, you name it, your IntelliJ, uh, any, any, your Kubernetes, your Docker, any tool that actually is created for developers. Oh, what, what, this... what, 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 one moment. So what about the, the very gray zone? So imagine like a, a company that is do, doing, for example, a bank, like a financial institution, but they're implementing the open API, uh, like open banking API that um, exposes the banking services through the API. So the audience of this product are developers. 
So should this bank or this financial institution have developer relations? Absolutely. The fact that the product is API and not something that is consumed like downloadable on-prem doesn't change anything. If you think about it, all our cloud computing providers like your AWS and, and Azure and Google Cloud platforms are just a bunch of APIs. And uh, yeah. So why not? Of course. Uh, it doesn't matter if the product is the, is, is API or, or installed on premises in your organization. Uh, a product is a product is a product. You can say, well, it's not maybe not the main product for a bank, for example, but it's still a very uh, big part of what they want to achieve. And those definitely deserve developer relations. So there is no problem with particularly API oriented products uh, at all. It's, it's, still, it's still a product for developers. Okay, uh, if we forget about the product itself, but uh, insist that the company is doing a lot of software development, which is like basically every company now in the world, uh, still, should they have developer relations because they still need to hire developers? And You're from right. that perspective... Right. So so the other very useful use case for developer relations is developer relations for uh, talent acquisition or for, if you want to call it, your employer brand. In the end of the day, when you need to hire developers, you are um, fighting for a product as well. Those product, the product will be the developers. Instead of selling, you're buying. Now, there are a couple of ways to make sure that you buy good quality and pay less. Uh, right? So, and, and one of those is to make sure that the developers that you are hiring prefer to work in your organization comparing to any other organization that competes with you on the recruitment market. Uh, and now I don't mean compete with you with product, but I mean compete with you looking for the same profile of developers, right? And then you have two options. You can pay more and, uh, uh, and uh, kind of lose money on that, or uh, you can pay less if the developers will prefer you to other options. And the reason why the developers will prefer you to other options, it's not only the benefits that you give them, free lunch or whatever, but also the technology that those developers are going to work on. So if you manage to convince the, uh, the, your, the target audience that your technology is more interesting, superior, more exciting, you name it, than the other company, this, uh, pro, uh, this um, potential recruit will go working in your organization and not in this other company. So picking up an example, it's like comparing the hiring offering from the IntelliJ IDEA versus, I don't know, VS Code or, or Emacs. Or whatever. So, like JetBrains has a very strong developer brand, I suppose. Exactly. So they're kind of using that to their advantage to to hire the talented people who are able to work on the text editors, on the IDs, and related products. Absolutely. And think about like do like a thought experiment. Uh, think about an ad for a job. One, which are exactly the same. One comes from the company that you know that the technology is absolutely awesome. And the other, you know, that comes from the company that technology is backwards, old, and kind of not, not very exciting. Same job offer exactly. Where will you want to go? Yeah, Obviously, you will course. go to the company that you know that the technology is more, uh, 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 is more awesome. How do you know that? This is their developer relations. Think about Netflix. On top of paying above the market, they also do tons of developer relations. You see blogs from their engineers. You see their booth in conferences. Oh, oh yeah, the, 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 the blog is crazy. It's like uh, one of the recent posts were like 29 minutes long. And I was thinking like, hey, if I wanted to read the book, I would go to the library. Come on. They they speak at the conferences a lot. Why do they do that? They don't have a product that that 
to that sells to developers. It's only the employer brand and it looks amazing and it, it works great. Tons of people will work for Netflix where everything else is, the, where other author offers are the same. They will choose Netflix over everybody else. Yeah, yeah, sounds cool. Okay, uh, let's uh, continue with your work at Gradle. So, like as we figured out recently with Artem Zinatulin, uh, if you if you haven't seen, there will be a, a pop up here a bit it's later. A, it's a great episode. Highly recommend it. Yeah, cool. Thank you. So, uh, like as we figured out, like build system are essential for modern development, right? And like you're kind of representing the developer relations now for them. So Absolutely. what are the biggest challenges that you see in the adoption of Gradle in the developer community nowadays? This is this is an excellent question because uh, it's uh, it's both very easy and very hard. It's very easy because everybody understands how essential developer tools are uh, for, for modern software development and how everything is um, intertwined together and you have to use the right tool for the job. Uh, on the other side, most of the people would not get into the woods of build and CI and CD unless they really have to, because this is, although related, a completely different domain. If you are a software developer, you probably know the basics of the uh, uh, of the build system. You know that it takes, the. if we're talking about JVM, it takes the classes, it compiles them, it puts them into jars, wars, and whatever, and then it deploys them to whatever uh, artifact repository you're using. And this is kind of, and you know how to run the commands, your MVN clean install or your Gradle clean build, but this is where your knowledge kind of ends. Well, you know what? You also know how to add dependencies that you need to your work. So you will go and add dependencies in whatever Maven or Gradle, but this is where your knowledge kind of ends. And you're happy with that because this is not your domain. Now, the problem begins when something goes wrong. Your build doesn't work. You want it to do more than just that. You want to um, add some kind of functionality which is not there by default. Maybe you have tests that run and, and now fail and you don't know why. And you think about, maybe I need to run this test one more time and see if it's flaky. Maybe the environment that the build runs is doesn't work for this test. So I need to switch the target environment for this test. You, you start to get into a black hole of a different domain, which is complicated by itself and you really need to be a pro there. And this is where uh, you kind of, oh, geez, I hate this thing because I don't understand what's going on and it prevents me to do my work. Now, it brings the creators of those build tools to a very interesting dilemma. From one side, we want to give something that as simple, as understandable, as predictable to the developers as much as possible. This is what Maven does successfully for what it'd be like 15 years uh, now, just because of that. The great thing about Maven is that the project uh, tagline is project comprehension tool. Maven is not a build tool. Maven is... What? If you go to Maven uh, website, you will see that. Okay, okay. So Maven, Maven maven.com. Is... Here, uh, I read, not, not, I read not, not, not. the first line. Welcome to Apache Maven. Apache Maven is software project management and comprehension tool. Yeah, exactly. So Maven builds a project using its project object model. And the it does not, well, the, the rest is technicalities. But yeah. the fact that they call themselves a project comprehension tool is ingenious and right on point because most of the developers in the world will use Maven as a way to understand the project. 
They say, so, okay. So, 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 so you mean in order to understand like which models do we have, what are the dependencies between them and so on. So this is like a right tool. It just describes you how, how it's structured. You look, okay, there is POMXML in this, in the root directory. I know a lot about this project without even opening it, right? I know this, how the depend the, where to look for the dependencies. I know how the file structure will look like. I know where to look for sources. I know where to look for the descriptors. I know how to understand this project without opening a single line of code. And this is so important. And this is brilliant on Maven's part. Now, on the more so, you can also know how the project is built. Because if you know a little bit of Maven, you know the life cycle of Maven project, you know how to expect this single artifact from a single model, which is a based philosophy on, on, on of Maven. You can not only understand the project, but you can also understand the process of this project automation of the build. And this is obviously a blessing for the majority of projects. And this is one of the reasons why Maven is still dominating, although it has its, um, I would say, age is starting to show off, right? The technology behind it, it's not best. The descriptors, those tons of XMLs on top of XMLs are annoying. But in the end of the day, Maven is going strong because it provides the value of comprehension to people who don't care about build systems. Okay, so this is this becomes a nice isolation or nice abstraction over the project. Exactly. Like here's the structure, exactly. like say Maven install, and that's it. The downside of this simplification is that if the project needs to do something more complicated than this basic, well-known, familiar structure of Maven we are in hell this is <coughs> excuse me this is true for every framework which is very very opinionated because the benefits of opinionated frameworks is that they give you the 80% that you want and expect and need out of the box very easily but every step in the gray zone of those 20% of the shoulders this is where you're going to start fighting this framework instead of fr framework helping you. And that's exactly where Gradle kind of uh, shines because it provides still the same framework. It uses the same ideas from Maven. The project uh, layout will be the same. The dependencies are described exactly the same. The syntaxes will be a little different, but in the, the end of the day, if you look at the vanilla simplest build in Gradle, you will feel right at home coming from Maven. It will also give you the opportunity to go beyond what Maven allows you without fighting with the tool where it's obviously also a blessing, but also a curse. Because then people who understand the build or who think they understand the build will run with optimizations, improvements, and tons of weird stuff that makes the build that was supposed to be a comprehension tool something uncomprehensible and something that without an expertise in build, you won't be able to understand or deal with. And this is the exact trade-off that we are living in. It's a tool that is necessary for everybody. Everybody touches it, but very few really understand it. And this is a very dangerous combination that is very, very hard to solve. So, so if I got it right, you're saying that uh, we need to you know, give this opportunity to understand the project and make the tool of building uh, the project uh, flexible enough for the uh, for the developers to to solve their issues with the build, right? And not making this as a super complicated mess that no one will be able to comprehend. And this is your responsibility. You're as someone who is in charge for the build of the project. Yes. We can do it very powerful and probably very complicated and, and very dirty, especially with Gradle. It's easy to do. But 
as we expect from software developers to be responsible for what they are doing when it comes to their application code, we expect the same from people who touch the build. Gradle makes it easy to do very powerful things, but it's also your responsibility that those powerful things are developed in the way that is easy to maintain, easy to comprehend, easy to use, don't make a mess, and basically maintain this tool as a comprehension tool for your project. Okay, okay. So, uh, but why can't we just uh, call somebody from the platform engineering team or built engineering team and say, hey, just just fix it for me, do it, do it, do it? Because your build directly affects your productivity immediately. You can say, well, there are some of aspects of the platform that if they are doesn't work and I afraid to touch it, I can rely on my platform engineer to come and fix it for me, but I still can work. In case of build, if your build doesn't work or slow, or you have flaky tests, or you are unsure what's happening, you cannot work at all. What you can do there is just go ahead and try to do stuff. You will go and you'll comment out some tests and you will try and dump in something that you found in Stack Overflow and try to do anything just to pass this hurdle of build running in order to get the feedback that you need to continue working for the rest of your day. Build is extremely powerful obstacle in your developer experience, in your productivity. And this is why Gradle now has an entire um, focus on this topic of developer productivity engineering or DPE, how, how we call it. My job in Gradle is being advocate for developer productivity engineering, actually, and not necessarily the Gradle build tool, because the developer productivity engineering is a much more fundamental problem than particularly how do you add a dependency in your build tool in the more effective way, because it affects everybody constantly. The number of hours that are wasted on unproductive environments is mind boggling. And this is something that uh, Gradle is trying to solve, not only with the great tool, but as a bigger mission of tackling the developer productivity engineering uh, challenge. Yeah, yeah. I remember this XKCD comics where like uh, where two developers are battling with the swords and somebody is asking, hey, why aren't it working? It's building. Okay, right. carry, and carry on. And this is a terrible, I mean, it's super funny, but it, it's, it cannot be further from reality. When you need to sit and wait for the build, you're not having fun. Not yeah. at all. You're usually miserable because you have two options. Both of them are terrible. One option is sit and wait for the build. And the other is starting doing something else. Yeah, and bo both starting are awful. Do yeah. Starting doing something else is terrible because you will have two context switches. One is now and the second when you go back to the project. Context switches are extremely costly for your cognitive fuel. Yeah, for... it's like it's like it's like twenty percent of the lost performance with uh, every new every new task. So when you switch a couple of times, your productivity like decreased two times already. So and there are, there are tons of research done about that. And one of the most fascinating is the one that ties context switches with uh, Daniel Kahneman work about system one and system two thinking that he got his Nobel Prize on and uh, an amazing book, uh, 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 Thinking uh, Fast, Thinking Slow is about that 
the idea is that you have two systems in your brain. The one is responsible for um, actions that won't require like a uh, heavy uh, 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 deliberation or uh, complicated decisions. And this is stuff that you do on, on autopilot, right? Uh, and the, the other th the other part is the part that requires uh, thinking and uh, generally like uh, uh, um, decisions uh, which you need to think about. And obviously most of the development is done with system two because it's hard cognitive work. Now, when you do those context switches, you waste this fuel that powers system two and you will become tired more, uh, you, you will become tired faster. Now, the problem with that is that you won't say, okay, I'm tired for today. I need a rest and go back to see this code tomorrow in order to be productive. No, you are, you are going to fall back in coding with system one and you will write code. But unless it's a very simple code that you need to write, your code won't be as good as the code you will write when using system two. The problem is no one will ever know it. Your product will be less. Your product will be will do will perform worse. Worse. Yeah, exactly. But no one will be able to put a finger and say, well, that's because Vladimir was tired on last Thursday because his build, he had flunky tests and he had to do a couple of context switches. No one will be able to recognize it while this was exactly the reason. So tackling those is one of the most important challenges in developer productivity engineering. And this is what's fascinating about it. So we said we have two, we have two options. The one is context switch, which is bad, which is bad for the reason that we mentioned. The other option is, and this is something that we do without even realizing it, is avoiding the context switch by waiting. And there are fascinating researchers that can tell you how much time a person is ready to wait until they give up and go to the other option, which is context switch. And the what, average, 40, by the 40, way, 45 seconds? Uh, no, the, actually the average is about 10 minutes. Oh my God. You will wait for a build to complete. You will stare on the log passing in your console or IntelliJ for 10 minutes without doing anything just to prevent the cognitive cost of context switching. And those 10 minutes are just wasted. And when you, you multiply it by all the developers that work on uh, on this project and by days in a, in, a, uh, in a year or whatever, how you manage it, the numbers are really, really astonishing. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and, and then you rename one variable and you, you have all the same thing again, another 10 minutes. Let's go. And of course, most of it doesn't doesn't even have to run. Because most of the yeah. tests are not affected by this change. Most of the compilation tasks are not affected at all by, by this change. But if the, if the build is not set up to maximize developer productivity, it will do it all over again. Yeah. I, I, again, this, the, those concepts were uh, tackled somehow with, with Artem. So he explains very well, uh, like why build systems should using caching, why there should be like application binary and interfaces, the dependency graphs and, and so on and so on. Let's, so you uh, had to wait, you had to wait to entire new episode to know that there is a name for this optimization and it's called developer productivity engineering. Yeah, go. yeah, th th that's a new term. Thank you. I, I learned something today. So yeah, uh, let, let's uh, let's ask some questions that we have in the chat. So uh, thank you guys for the for the questions. So the first one, which is really interesting to me, is like, is there such role as internal DevRel inside of the organization without public world exposure? Absolutely. And this is the third. You remember how we mentioned we have three. Uh, goals of developer relations, the product, the employer brand, and the third is called either um, innovation uh, developer relations or internal developer relations. And 
the goal, let me just paste uh, here is an ebook uh, or a handbook about developer productivity engineering written by Hans Doctor, the founder of uh, Gradle and with, uh, in, uh, with input from tons of other different very smart people in the field. Um, so yeah, going back to innovation or internal developer relations. Now, the goal of those is to be able to optimize the grassroots innovation that exists in most of the technical organizations and funnel those grassroots initiatives into an organizational changing behavior. It's basically finding those people who think about stuff that is important for their organization, other developers, the entire industry, elevating them what they are saying inside the organization and maybe outside the organization and make sure that those efforts are uh, actually appreciated, compensated, and brought to the limelight of the entire organization. So when someone in your company goes and speaks at the meetups, who knows about that? Why it is important? You're not a product company. You are not hiring, let's say, in this region at all. So you don't have an employer brand uh, goals in this particular region. But uh, Vladimir did an amazing talk on um, on, a con on a conference. Why it is important for their? Is it important for your organization? Of course. Why? Because this is how your company keeps innovating and being on the cutting edge of technology. Who know about that? No one. Isn't it a shame? Let's change it through internal developer advocacy. This podcast, who knows involved about Architecture Weekly? Do yeah, so, so, yeah, some guys know, but only because I'm posting the links to the chat and basically that's it. Exactly, right? So if you had a developer advocate with you or a developer relations professional with you, that could uh, amplify what you are doing inside Bolt. We can think, you and I, we can think about a dozen ways of how it could actually improve Bolt as a technological organization. Yeah, I would actually really appreciate if my colleagues uh, were reading my newsletter a little bit more because I shared the awesome links there, at least to my understanding. But uh, yeah, uh, it, my, my next question is about pretty much the same topic. So uh, like we we started to talk about the platform engineers, like how crucial this internal developer relations work for for them. No, it's it's exactly the same, right? So platform engineers as uh, are uh, they provide a service to developers. It is internal service for the developers in the organization, but in an essence, it doesn't, it's it's not different from a company providing its service from the developers out there. And if we already established that the way to improve the relationship between the service provider and the developers that consume it is developer relations, isn't it only natural that the platform engineers will shine and their work will be propagated through developer relations inside the organization? Okay, okay, cool. So we have very little time. So I think we have room for two questions. So one is like, uh, it is asked here in the chat and it was asked yesterday in Twitter. So uh, like uh, how important is to be able to solve lead code problems or, or similar problems for like uh, DevRel engineers or developer so, advocates? So in the end of the day, lead code is a tool to prepare for technical interviews. And as we already mentioned, developer advocates should be highly technical people. Should they be as technical as your lead developer in, uh, in the organization? Probably not. Think about what do we need from them when we talk about, okay, what how they will be more effective. So for me, for example, um, as a developer advocate with Gradle, I probably need to be very familiar with Gradle build tool. 
I need to know all and in and out. I need to know how to solve problem with Gradle build tool. I also need to be very familiar with the technical aspects of build systems in general if I want to tackle problems of developer productivity engineering. I need to understand what project what problems occur in those builds in order to be able to solve them. Maybe I need to understand how tests run and fail on different software architectures. For example, what will be the difference between the test that runs on Windows and test and run on Linux? I need to know that Windows uses backslash when Linux uses slash. It's a very uh, technical detail, obviously, but do I need to know to solve lead code algorithmical problems in order to solve that? Probably not. So there is a lot of technical work probably not to the level that I need to crack all the lead code questions in order to get accepted as, as to, 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 to the job as developer advocate. Okay, okay. Thank you for answering. Uh, how much did you read about, you know, Gradle and build systems uh, since you started the job? Like what, what percentage of oh, time? Oh, this it? is what I'm doing right now, right? All I do now, I started a month ago and until today, all I do is learning. And I think I still have at least a couple of more months in the order I will feel comfortable enough to go and actually give any type of advice or, or d discover how other people can be more productive with the tools that we use. Because in the end of the day, especially when we're talking about people who use those tools, now, probably Artyom knows Gradle much better than I do. So it's kind of backwards because I'm supposed to know better than him. So I have a lot of catch up to do before I can do my job proactively and very efficiently. So and very efficiently. So what I do right now is is learning. Yeah. So I suppose it's like a mini degree. Uh, it's it's a lot of learning. Yes, yeah. yes. If and uh, first, first one of the first things that I uh, I read was the uh, developer productivity engineering handbook that I um, put here in the comments on YouTube. I highly recommend it. It's a it's a light reading, but it gives you a great perspective of for what for us for Gradle and for me personally is the next frontier of developer productivity. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, last question for today is like, if you were a chief technical officer of Gradle, what would you change? So, I would say there are almost two Gradles right now. There is the build tool, which is a very successful open source project that changes lives of millions of developers for the better. There are challenges in that, and mostly what we spoke about. How do we make sure then when people use this freedom that give that Gradle gives gives them, and not everybody have the same re notion of responsibility when using it? How can we mitigate it? And that, that was my kind of a debate, if you wish, with Gradle for um, 15 years now. How do we have this not very responsible people switch? that we can go ahead and lock certain features in Gradle for a certain type of project of certain types of teams. I would still love to see that happening. I bet that if we can do it, although it clashes with the entire ideology of freedom uh, uh, and responsibility, it will still benefit the entire industry because it will allow um, the more um, easy adoption of Gradle, even in teams which cannot rely on their members to be very uh, responsible with tools that give them um, more freedom. It's almost like now Gradle is giving a matchbox uh, to kids. Um, what I would love to do is give them a safe lighter instead of this matchbox. They can still light their stuff, but it's much safer to do. So that's that's kind of a, my uh, main wish based on my experience with Gradle over the years uh, to uh, the Gradle build tool part. And when we are talking about the um, 
developer productivity engineering aspect of that, well, uh, there is so much work to be done. Uh, the tool that exists today that implements a lot of the Gradle productivity engineering gains called Gradle Enterprise um, does amazing things, really. When you turn it on and you see the savings and you see how it improves the build and the productivity of developers, it's really mind-boggling. But a lot of people still don't know about it. And that's for, for us, the developer relations team to, to, to fix. But there are also a lot of work to do inside the product as well, making it more accessible for the developers to use, make the the user experience with the tool better and adding more features that implement developer productivity in the tool, supporting more tools, more ecosystems, supporting more ways of gain of gains and savings. Um, a lot of excitement over there. Keep an eye on this uh, field uh, and uh, you will see uh, how we can all make the developer's life easier and our world better through software. Okay, like uh, at this point, I'm feeling that it's too bad we're not using Gradle already at Bolt. So. <laughs> you don't have to use Gradle to use Gradle Enterprise. It works great with Maven, uh, with SBT, with soon with SBT, with Basel. You really don't have to use Gradle to enjoy developer productivity. Yeah, okay, cool. So th that's a great note to finish the interview. So uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed the conversation and, you know, learned a couple of new new stuff. So thanks a lot, folks. Uh, uh, please let us know in the comments, like what is the feature or change you would like to see in the Gradle, so Baruch can you know take a look and maybe bring it to to the product. And of course, if you like the interview, make sure you're subscribed to the channel because like new interviews come out almost every week. And uh, hit this like button; it helps to promote the the content to other people. Thanks, thanks again. Thanks to the viewers. Thanks to to Baruch. Thank you very much.